on YouTube and I'm going on live on YouTube on the phone, which is the opposite of what I usually do. And I'm live on Facebook using the webcam. So I've reversed them. It's normally YouTube webcam and Facebook uh, phone. I just need to figure out <laughs> how to turn on the... the uh... Yeah, it's not showing anything there. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. There's, no, there's nothing showing there. Uh... No, I can see, I can see myself. I can see the feed, it's completely black. Oh dear. I'm really sorry about this, folks. Okay, Alan Brayette is saying on YouTube I'm showing up. Well, great stuff. That's half the battle. 50% of it is working. Oh, why do they fix things that aren't broken? And critically, now you can't live stream from your phone. Why? What genius decided that? Okay. Yeah, Facebook is definitely having issues. I need to uh, try and figure this out rather quickly. Settings. Stream stream key is set up. It's not allowing me to change any of the video settings in um, on the uh, streaming software. It's not allowing me. It's, there's nothing. There's nothing showing up either. Video capture device. I mean, the the light is on on the camera. It's definitely connected. Yeah, I know all the Facebookers probably possibly don't have YouTube, Aaron. That's the only thing. I know, I know, I know. YouTube is working. The point is that I tried to do both simultaneously. I, Facebook has completely changed everything, and uh, I can't just go live direct from the webcam. It's telling me that I need to use a beta version of Chrome, um, and I downloaded it, but it wouldn't install. It's really, really odd. And yet the stupid thing is I can actually see. I can see my, I can see that it's working. The camera is working. The other option is used, pa use paired encoder. I have no idea what that means. Damn. Uh, and of course, I only discovered this when I went to go live because I thought everything would be, <laughs> I thought everything would be normal. Go on your computer, says Margaret. Yes, I'm trying to go on my trying to use. It says I'm live. Everything's set up. This settings. Let me just go back into this and have a look at the stream settings again. Facebook Live stream key is set up as it was. Okay, I'm going to stop streaming on YouTube or on there uh, on Facebook. <sighs> All the YouTubers are delighted because they're they're getting a better quality picture than usual. Settings stream. Let me have a look here now. I 
and YouTube is cutting out occasionally. I'm not sure why that is. I don't like this anyway. Let's see if it. Okay, let's start. Let's start YouTube again. Sorry, let's start Facebook again. See if we can make it happen. Looks to be black again. Hello, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, still not working. I can hear myself, but I can't see myself. Same thing again. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, so what I propose to do is uh, to uh, continue with a blank screen on Facebook uh, and continue with the live stream on YouTube. Um, I can I, I can hear the audio on YouTube, uh, uh, so that's what people have said. It's 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 black. It's a black screen, but they can hear me. So if everybody's happy to proceed on that basis, I will uh, I will continue. I will. The people on YouTube can see me. So if anybody on Facebook has YouTube, come over to YouTube, and you'll be able to watch. It's YouTube.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. What I can do afterwards is upload the YouTube video to Facebook. Um, completely, completely changed everything uh, in terms of live streaming without any warning whatsoever. It was it was working yesterday as normal and today it's completely changed. And um, that's very unfortunate. OK, everybody can hear me on Facebook, I take it. Oh, that's very, very, very annoying. Let me just have a look here. I'm going to play the stream here. Without any warning, everybody can hear me on Facebook. It's, it's, it's black. It's a black screen, but they can hear me. Okay. Right, so people can hear me. I still have no idea why they can't see. Uh, everything should be working. And of course, I can't change the settings in the middle of the stream. Yeah, you can probably hear that. I'm playing playing that back in the headphones there as well. Just so as I can hear it, but I'm going to have to lower those too. So my apologies, folks. Whoever heard of, if it's not broke, don't fix it, you know? Sound is good, okay. Can hear you fine loud and clear okay all right well that's what we're going to have to do for the moment okay i can with sincere apologies folks um we are now uh 25 26 minutes past eight and i'm only just literally just still haven't been able to figure it out sorry about that um Too many people using it, so Facebook fixes it to limit use. Yeah, that's what that's what it looks like. Okay, uh, I've no option but to proceed. And at this stage, to be honest, um, I, I I think I'll skip the hellos as well, which is very unusual. Um.
and just in case there is anybody I may have to edit this before I upload it what are we on we're on 10, 11 minutes in the YouTube version okay um, Orion well you see the thing about Orion in Irish myth is interesting because there's no um, there's nothing in Irish myth that specifically says this is the constellation that you know as Orion obviously uh, there's no doubt that um, arrangement of um, illustrious stars as it were very bright stars it's been known to cultures around the world um, f for many ages of humankind in fact probably since the first time we started looking at the stars back in the day um, my investigation of Orion began with Richard Moore in our research into Island of the Setting Sun which is where you'll find a lot of information pertaining to it <laughs> and as usual I have to um, I have to uh, alert you to the fact that uh, Island of the Setting Sun cannot be purchased except for second hand and the second hand copies are fairly horrendously expensive at the best of times I've seen them for sale for five hundred dollars a thousand dollars two thousand dollars three thousand dollars I'm not saying they're not worth it <laughs> um, but how do you start to disentangle you know constellations and the story of constellations from Irish mythology where as I said in previous episodes you don't have any information from the storytellers that says you know this is the story and this is what it relates to you only get that very very rarely such as in the story of the uh, no uh sorry uh Deirdre and the sons of Ishnuk. uh and we read that out of course and there's an alternative ending there in which Deirdre and nisha are buried in separate graves and trees grow up and their branches entwine and that they're disinterred by the king and buried on either side of a lake and the trees still grow but it's formerly uh, a scottish uh, who were Sc scottish emigrants um that that was their creation myth for the milky way that's how the milky way was formed in ireland we don't really have a any of that and that's unfortunate because you get little snippets now and again. One of those little snippets uh, came from the work of uh, Charles Valancy, who was mentioned last night uh, and in recent episodes, who was uh, a British military surveyor. All the comments have disappeared off my screen for, for YouTube. Oh, here we go. All the uh, information about, a lot of information about how Irish peasants uh, described the stars and some of the constellations uh, was given to Valancy in the late 18th century in the 1700s and it was very interesting because um, and I'm going to read this to you in relation to our friend Orion the constellations of the comments keep disappearing on YouTube until I touch the screen um 55 viewers on YouTube. Now that's higher than YouTube would normally be, but I know that uh, Facebook is so currently saying 26, which is a lot lower. Anyway, hopefully um, afterwards I'll get to sort of investigate and fix it for tomorrow so that it will work, even if it means reversing things and doing webcam on Facebook and uh, ca camera phone on, uh, on YouTube. That's okay, so long as we can get it sorted out. Valancy refers to another incident which occurred in a mountainous area of West Cork not long after he had come to Ireland from Gibraltar. Here an aged cottager offered to be their guide on a fine starry night. The peasant pointed to the constellation and he said that was Caomai, C-A-O-M-A-I, that's C-A-O-M-A-I, all one word, <coughs> or the armed king. And he described the three upright stars to be his spear or scepter, and the three horizontal stars, he said, was his sword belt. He infers that, infers that uh, Caomai is an armed man in Shaw's dictionary, but in fact Shaw spells it, Cleavy, C A O M H A I G H, and explains it as 
a man expert at arms. This might seem like a peculiar reference to the constellation Orion. But in Island of the Setting Sun, we explored the idea that some of the principal characters of ancient Irish myth might have been inspired by this brilliant anthropomorphic constellation. And we'll get to those uh, shortly. Um, and just on that front, something I was writing very, 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 very recently uh, in relation to Kimui uh, and the Armed King. I think that's very interesting uh, because of our initial investigations, that is with Richard Moore over 20 years ago. <clears throat> we looked at Irish myth and in particular, we looked at certain characters of Irish myth. Uh, and, and, and investigated whether perhaps they might be related to the constellation Orion. Now, if you look uh, in Island of the Setting Sun in the index, <coughs> forgive me. Uh, and if you look up Orion, you will see uh, that there are dozens and dozens of <laughs> uh, pages upon which the word Orion f falls or the name Orion. However, uh, the first of the characters to, to come, come under the spotlight uh, and to, 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 come into our, uh, to come into our realm of suspicion. Any of the latecomers, uh, I'm having terrible technical problems. Uh, the live feed on Facebook is not visible uh, because Facebook <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has completely changed its interface and I haven't a clue what they're at. Uh, and I'm live streaming on YouTube successfully, it seems, and people can see and hear me on YouTube. If you're happy not to see my ugly smush on Facebook, then by all means continue watching there. And now to add insult to injury, I have a very dry throat. <coughs> this isn't going well. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh... The first of those characters to come into our sort of purview uh, was Nuadu of the Silk. Well, it's occasionally saying uh, it's disconnected here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but um, the story of Nuadu is that he was uh, king of the Tuatadanan when they arrived in Ireland. According to Laura Gawala, he had been king of the two of the Danon, uh, seven years before they came to Ireland when they were studying uh, their druidic arts in the northern isles and northern cities of the world. Uh, when they arrived in Ireland, uh, there was a battle between the two of the Danon and the Fir Vullag. Basically, the two of the Danon routed the Fir Vullag in what's called the First Battle of Moitura or the Battle of Moitura in Kong, the Ka Moitura Kong. Um, now, in that battle, Nuadu's arm was chopped off and very specifically, it was lopped off at the shoulder uh, by a warrior called Sreng, S-R-E-N-G. And it is a tradition, of course, and this is more of a medieval tradition, but one cannot be sure how far into history and prehistory the roots of this tradition actually go. But there's a tradition in Ireland that the king cannot be blemished because the king is ritually married to the land uh, in the form of the sovereignty goddess uh, through something that we call the banish re, the uh, sacred marriage of the king. And a king could not be blemished in any way, could not be injured or defaced in any way, because if he was, that blemish, that injury or that um, defacement could also reflect itself in the health of the people and the kingdom and the landscape and so it was a case that if a king was blemished in fact he, he could not only be deposed but he could actually be ritually killed he could be killed by the uh, the population now in Noadu's case because of his injury at the first battle of Moitura he had to um he had to relinquish the throne, as it were. Now, there's never really a mention of the word throne in Irish mythology. There's no, you know, we, we don't think of Irish kingship in terms of, a, you know, a, a, a stone or a, a marble. Uh, 
uh, and rule over the people, the Tua, uh, the, the Tua being his own tribe. And then if he was an over king, of course, he would be king of several kingdoms or several provinces all at once. Lagging here too and buffering, says Aaron, better than nothing. Yeah, I had that because it keeps coming up occasionally saying, you know, uh, so we're going to have to try and figure out. Uh, and that's going to be some work for me tonight afterwards to see what can be done. Facebook, thank you. Um, thank you so much for fixing something that wasn't broken. I really have to say at this moment in time, um, you know, uh, you, uh, you have a long history of doing it. You have a long history of changing things dr drastically uh, when there was absolutely nothing wrong with the way they were. But anyway, um, anyway, Noadu has to abdicate, as it were. He has to give up the kingship. At this time, the, the Danans are petitioned by um, uh, Bress, who is... Uh, part Fomorian and it was sort of suggested that if you made Bress king uh, that uh, you know it would strengthen uh, the friendship as it were between the Dedanans and the Fomorians even though they were kind of mortal enemies the Dedanans agreed to this and uh, Bress becomes the um the uh, the symbol or the representation of uh, ineptitude, incompetent rule, uh, and everything falls asunder under his reign. He makes the principal deities of the Dedanon do all the menial tasks like cut firewood and build forts and stuff. Uh, nobody's getting fed properly. He banishes, by the way, music and poetry, which is a complete disaster, as you know, uh, when a nation's uh, arts decline then that nation itself usually is in for a tumble there are parallels to that of course in modern politics but we're not going there in the in the background um the D, the two of the dan and healer dian kecht fashions a very special arm for um nuadu uh it's made of silver <laughs> and of course if you think in terms of prehistoric mythology if you uh, added to uh, one could say interfered with but it's certainly been added to um, because silver I'm not sure exactly how long silver is, is around but I'm, I'm pretty sure gold came with the Iron Age um, and then there's an even more curious episode Dian Kecht's son Miak fashions a human arm and it appears to be like a some sort of a weird uh, forerunner or prognostication of what's it called? Um, not not mo molecular biology, but but you know uh, genetics and prosthesis. I mean, the idea that Nuadu had a fully working silver arm, which is how the myth describes it, and that it worked like a normal arm, you know, and the and the hand and the fingers and all the rest. It is strange enough, but the idea that his son Miak grew an extra arm onto his arm and then, you know, put that on to Nuadu is even stranger again. Nuadu uh, then obviously he, he relinquishes his silver arm, which is given to Miak as a guerdon, and we read that the other night, as a reward. Um, and <laughs> so uh, Nuadu's arm is restored and because his blemish has been removed uh he's he is capable of being restored to the kingship uh, at, at which time the Dedanans go back to Bress and say look we don't think you're fit to rule um Bress says to them fair enough but can I rule for another seven years anyway and they somehow agree to that despite uh having decided he's not fit to be the king One wonders in this story if this isn't a reference to the constellation Orion and the armed king that uh, Valency's West Cork peasant pointed out to him in the 18th century. And that is because if you look at the constellation Orion and if you look at the layout of the constellation, the arrangement of the stars, 
and its position with regards to ha to the um, to the Milky Way, it's very interesting, because the shoulder of Orion, uh, the the he's got, you know, his left shoulder is Betelgeuse, this bright red star, and his right shoulder is a star called Bellatrix, and then you know the other bright star is the the the. the the very great bright star is the bottom right star, Rigel, which means bright knee, and that's interesting as well. But one wonders whether the lopping off of his arm at the, you know, at the shoulder and the replacement of it with a silver arm. You see, if you look at Orion from Betelgeuse up, this arm is actually embedded in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way being the heavenly Boyne and the Boyne being the earthly Milky Way the two reflecting each other, as it were. Uh, in in the Dinshemicus, uh, parts of the Boyne are described as being silvery. And of course, um, we talked about Slaura Lu in the episode a while back about um, the old Irish names and the mythology about the Milky Way, uh, that Lu was supposed to have worn the Milky Way as a silver chain around his neck. And the fact that uh, Nuadu's arm is raised up into the Milky Way led us to uh, the silver arm of Orion and that Nuadu was in fact uh, Orion. And I think there's something that I've written about lately that uh, his English equivalent Nodons was known as the Catcher. And we wondered whether that arm is very important in cosmology, uh, in, in the sort of... Uh, cosmology of the ancients I believe and that is because the arm of Orion serves as a sort of a 13th zodiac constellation squeezed in between the horns of Taurus and the feet of Gemini because it is that area of the sky that's one of two points in the sky where the sun's path which we call the ecliptic crosses the Milky Way or the sky river the heavenly Boyne, as it were one of those is above Orion between the horns of Taurus and the feet of Gemini and the other is in Sagittarius slash Scorpius uh, beneath Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. And so the sun and the moon and the planets only cross the Milky Way at two points in the sky. Uh, one of those, as I say, being uh, the hand of Orion. Uh, and the idea of Nuadu possibly being a catcher, was he catching the planets and the sun and throwing them along the ecliptic? And this is a theme that came up because as soon as he is restored to the kingship uh, he is having a celebration at the hill of tara uh, after bress has gone away uh, and by the way when he goes away he's preparing for war which is the second battle of moitura um, against the fomorians uh, and really what he's doing is he was playing for time with the dedanans to gather an army uh, so that they could attack ireland and take it from the dedanans Nuadu basically doesn't play any more important role in the story, in the myth, from that point forward. In fact, if you look at uh, Elizabeth Grey, it's Grey, isn't it? It's Grey. Um, yeah, E.A. Grey. If you look at Elizabeth Grey's translation of Kot Moitura, you will see that after Nuado is restored at uh, Tara, he is not mentioned in the story except once, and that is... In the second battle of Moitura, he is killed. He loses his life. But what happens is Lu comes to Tara. Lu Samaldonok or Lu Lunonchklech. Uh, and he asks uh, if he can proffer his gifts uh, uh, or he, if he can offer his gifts to the king. And the gatekeeper asks him what gifts he has. And he keeps telling them we have a poet and we have a smith and we have a warrior and we have a... Uh, you know a cupbearer and we have a right and we have this and that and the other and uh, Lou says well I have all of these talents do you have any man who has all these uh, abilities and of course he doesn't and he's admitted into Tara and from then on basically Lou is the one who plans the second battle of Moitura he's the one who marshals uh, all of the chief deities of the Dedanans and asks them uh, what they can bring to the battle uh, and organises and marshals the troops uh, Nuadu it appears has only been restituted or restored to the throne to keep it warm for Lou. Now Lou, one of his epithets is Lou Lawfada, meaning Lou, Lou of the Long Arm. Uh, and I have proposed that uh, that is because uh, he was coming to ta basically take the kingship to replace Nuadu as the king, uh, not forgetting of course his vital role in Kotmoitura, the second battle of Moitura, 
is that he is the one who's going to kill Balor, the evil uh, solar aspect or the evil chief uh, deity or uh, a chief being uh, of the uh, Fomorians whose great eye is like a scorching sun. So the sun in all its baleful aspects, the sun in its scorching aspects, the sun that would whose reign is twice as long as Nuadu's. We are told that Nuadu, in Lower Gawala, we're told that Nuadu reigns for 20 years and that Nuadu, or Lu after him reigns for 40. And eventually then the kingship passes to Dagda who reigns for 80. So the kingships keep doubling uh, until the next one after Dagda who's a lot, a lot shorter. Uh, Balor equals Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I know. Don't get me started. Um, I'm totally distracted too. I was so distracted about trying to get that sorted. I lost my train of thought completely and I'm trying to keep it going as best I can. I might suggest that uh, we come back to the topic again tomorrow if I can fix things to maybe work a little bit better. I might try and do a couple of tests. What's really, 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 really very annoying is that I now cannot do live broadcasts from my phone, which means I can't do the live broadcasts from the Boyne Valley uh, that you're so used to seeing. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see what uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of protests to Facebook about that. Um, Nuadu and Lou were interesting. Lou used a weapon in the second battle of Moitura that's very interesting. It's described as a, a, a ball, a giant ball consisting of the brains of his dead enemies hardened with lime, which to me sounds like and it's called a tathlum. And Lou uses the tathlum against his enemies. And one thinks of Lou being Orion, throwing the moon around the sky, maybe as a weapon to scatter uh, the enemies. Um, but then, you know, a long, long time ago, uh, uh, I can still remember. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, when myself and Richard were researching Ireland, um, we, we we became very interested in the story of Amargin or Amargin, uh, Glundial, Amargin of the Bright Knee. Uh, and that's immediately interesting because of the Bright Knee star of Orion that we know as Rigel, which is an Arabic word, which basically means Bright Knee. Uh, and we wondered whether uh, perhaps Amargin or Amargin might correspond with Orion. What's interesting about Amargin is he is the camera. He is the one that helps the Milesians to affect their landing, their second landing. And that is because while the Milesians came militarily as an invasion force, it was Aurigine who sort of spoke directly in poetic terms to the tutelary goddesses, I apologise, to the guardian goddesses, er Banba, Eru and Fola, who we met uh, a number of episodes back not too, not too, not too long ago in the past week or so. Um, just after Bialtana, uh, in fact. Uh, number 56, Eru, guardian goddess of Ireland. And uh, they, she asked if, you know, if the island could be named after her and Amargin promised her that it would be so. And she said that long had the soothsayers foretold the coming of the Milesians and that theirs, uh, that the island would be theirs forever. I do apologize. Looks like um, a lot of glitches tonight. <laughs> and so after they meet with the Dedanan kings, Makul, Makhecht and Magrania at Tara, an agreement is reached again with Aurigin that they would put back out to sea and if they could land again, Ireland would be theirs. Of course, when they go to sea, there's a big storm raised by the, Dedan by the Dedanans, but the Milesians uh, managed to effect a landing. Don is killed. He's the one who wanted to fight all the time. He was killed. He was drowned. But Aurigin was the one who, who invoked the land and the sea and actually made it calm. Um, yeah, I've, there's people still commenting about, yeah, well, we're, uh, unfortunately, we've encountered fairly substantial difficulties tonight in that uh, Facebook has completely changed how it does its live broadcast. And it's, it's it, it, uh, from what I can see, it is impossible to do it from your phone now. I, I could not 
uh, live stream from the phone. I tried to set up a stream through streaming software and it's not working. I tried to do it directly from the webcam and that wasn't working. And the best I've been able to manage is uh, sound, but no video on Facebook, but over here on YouTube, apparently we're faring a little bit better. Um, Aragine was the one who said, uh, who but I knows the place where the sun sets? Who but I knows the ages of the moon? What land is better than this island of the setting sun? And of course, that's where we got the title astronomer. We refer to him constantly as an astronomer. He is the one who said to be buried at Millmount here in Drogheda, which is a, a British military tower built on top of a Norman castle moat uh, built on top of a prehistoric burial mound. Uh, one of only two prehistoric burial mounds in Ireland that has a road going around its perimeter. Uh, there's one also in a housing estate in County Sligo, which is very interesting. Um, what connects Aurigeen with Tara, which is where the king, the Milesian kings reigned from, and of course it was Eremon and Eber, his brothers, who became the first joint kings of Ireland. They later had a fight and Eremon killed Eber and took uh, 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 sole kingship of the island. Um, it was Eremon's wife, Tia, who, who chose Drum Cain, the beautiful ridge, as the place where they would reign from and where she would be buried. And of course, that became known as Cha Wur, the moor or wall or rampart of Tia. Uh, and Chower became Tara in the anglicised version. And they are connected, interestingly, in the Neolithic because viewed from Millmount, Orion sets over Tara, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, uh, um, it's, it's like, you know, the king of the sky touches the stone, the coronation stone, the uh, the phallic coronation stone known as Leo Foil. And of course, that had been brought, according to Laura Gawala, that had been brought to Tara by uh, the Tua de Danon when they came to Ireland. They brought these four mysterious artifacts with them. Uh, the, the, the Spear of Lu, the Sword of Nuadu, uh, the, the, the Dogda's Cauldron, and... Uh, uh, Leo Foyle, the stone of destiny as it's called, the stone that would scream out when the one who would be rightful king uh, stood upon it or stepped upon it or put his foot or his knee on it. And I thought that was very interesting cosmology that Orion's setting viewed from Millmount, and Millmount is allegedly the place where Aragin is buried. Uh, in fact, uh, in Johnston's history of Drogheda from the early part of pre famine, uh, he relates in 1844 how. Uh, this warrior bard, that is Amergin, fell in battle in Meath and is supposed to have been here buried on the southern shore of the River Boyne, where, sorry, according to the fashion of the time, the funeral pile, now known as the Millmount, was then elevated over his body. And of course, that was a belief into the 20th uh, century. Uh, there were still local uh, folklorists, uh, people interested in the old uh, stories uh, about Drogheda and the Boyne Valley, who related that Millmount was not just the burial place of Armagan, but in fact, it was one of the mounds of Brunabonia. Another tradition associated with it is, is that it is the burial place of the wife of the Goban Sayer, the Goban Sayer being sort of a, a later version of the Smith, uh, uh, go, go on or Gov, Gov, Gonyu or Govnu, um, and she was supposed to be buried there. Um, that is recorded in the annals because the annals say that the, the caves were, were raided by the Vikings in the 9th century, I think in the year eight, 861 AD. And that's where we were talking about in the in the episode of um, Onomasticon Gaelicum, we were talking about Ahu Aldi being one of the alternative names for Newgrange because that is how it is named. Uh, the cave of Knogba and Ahu Aldi and the Knave the cave of Boadan, the shepherd of Elkmar at Douth, were all plundered by the Vikings, as well as the cave of the wife of the Goban in Drogheda. Uh, consequently, or interestingly, should I say, that alignment of Millmount and Tara also involves winter solstice setting sun. And if you're at Tara on summer solstice, the rising sun comes up over Millmount and Drogheda, although the two are not intervisible because of intervening features. Um, interesting also is the fact that if you trace that line roughly, uh, and this is the exact line, if you were to imagine that you're floating across the sky from Millmount towards the place where Orion sets, you would pass over Tara, 
uh, and then eventually come to Sheenecton, the hill upon which there are ancient monuments there, uh, where the stream of the Boyne first issues. Uh, now, the, the well of Segish or the Necton's well is very close by to Sheenecton, to the south of it. Um, but you're looking at Tara being positioned uh, on an axis between the source of the River Boyne and the estuary of the River Boyne. Now, the story of Aragine was that the second landing occurred at the Boyne estuary uh, and that he placed his foot on the shore of the Boyne, which I think is interesting symbolism because Orion not only stands on the shore of the heavenly Boyne River, but there's another river that runs off from the foot from Rigel uh, uh, in Orion in the sky called Eridanus very long riverine constellation that runs from the foot of Orion down into the southern hemisphere of the sky and one wonders if that wasn't part of the story that Aurigeen was setting his bright knee his foot against the shore of the river that the river being Eridanus when he chanted his famous words the rest as they say is history or should I say in this case the rest as they say is mythology um because uh, the Milesians uh, take over and the, the Danans retreat into the Shi or the monuments and the hollow hills as they said and promised that they would. They, of course, live up to their word, being the, uh, the, the good people that they are. But it goes kind of further and deeper than that uh, in a way that perhaps uh, we, we, we will have to delve into in more detail in another episode, which would be great because maybe I can sort of pick up again tomorrow evening with much less uh, of a distracted head on me. This has been by far the most difficult episode because I'm, I, uh, I was totally uh, put off the scent, as it were. I thought I was just going to go live at eight o'clock and say hello to you all and start talking. And, and then suddenly I realised I couldn't. We also talk about Fionn McCall and Cuchulain as possible uh, Orion personages in mythology. Cuchulain is interesting. Here, here is a description of Cuchulain from the, from the Thorn. A giant on the plain I see doing battle with the host I saw him hurling against that host two gay bulga and a spear and an ivory hilted sword. He towers on the battlefield in breastplate and red cloak. Now, in addition to that, is this fantastic quatrain, uh, which I must read to you. Uh, this is this is the part where Cuchulain uh, has been wounded and is resting and Lou, his uh, spiritual father, as it were, his deity, his god, his, his, his godfather, his deity father, you know, um, comes to him and says, Rise, mighty son of Ulster, now that your wounds have been healed, a fair man facing your foes in the starlit ford of night. And of course, Cuchulain was famed for fighting in ford water, such that he was often seen standing in ford water. And uh, he, he his brother, uh, I don't think they were biological brothers, but they were sort of like um, the spiritual brothers, Ferdia. And he used a magical spear called the Gay Bulga, which he threw in the water with his feet. Now, if you're thinking that this all sounds familiar, then re re rewind and refer back to the episode we did about the High Man. Uh, was that episode 25? No, it's episode 12. There you go. A long time ago. Uh, where the high man appears to stand in the Boyne River with one of his legs at Millmount, uh, perhaps Aragine's bright knee, uh, Aragine being one of the versions of the high man. Um, that Cuchulain was also uh, the one who was able to throw things. He was famed for throwing the schlitter, which is the ball, the hurl, you know, the ball that you play hurling with. And he was able to throw the ball into the air and throw the hurl into the air out of his hand and hit the ball accurately. And of course, this is how he killed the hound. Um, we referred back to the fact that um, uh, certainly in earlier medieval sources, uh, uh, Leo, the constellation we know as Leo the lion was not known as Leo the lion. It was known as Coo the hound. Uh, and we speculated that uh, Cuchulain's hitting of the sh the, the Schlitter um, was uh, Orion uh, throwing the moon uh, along its path uh, from the upraised hand of Orion through the constellations of Gemini and Cancer the Crab into 
the mouth of the hound, the hound constellation, and out its entrails, killing it instantly. And of course, uh, at that time, he was called Satanta. And Cullen, who was the smith who owned the hound, was disconsolate. And he said, what am I going to do? And Satanta said to him, I'll be your hound. And thus he became known as Ku Cullen, the Hound of Cullen. Another great uh, warrior figure who's known for throwing things is uh, Fionn McCool. His name means bright son of the hazel and more likely even starry son of the hazel. And he is descended on the maternal side from Nuadu, interestingly. Fionn, like Cucullan, was adept at hurling and was good with a spear too, in one tail killing a charging sow with his weapon. Identified by the Romans with Mars. Fionn's association with the hazel marks him out as a likely manifestation of, of Orion. Not only did the Orion Nebula set in the direction of Necton's well viewed from Millmount, but the entire constellation set in the direction of the Hill of Allen, which is said to have been one of the two chief places of abode of the celebrated Finn McCool. His burial place is also said to be Schlieve Gullion, a cairn on its summit recalled as being his final place of rest. Fionn is also associated with fighting at Fords. I'm reading from Island of the Setting Sun, by the way, if anyone asks. <laughs> I can't show it to you on Facebook because you can't see it. In the story about the death of Finn, the great hero and his 1500 warriors went to Aubra on the southern Boyne and they arrayed themselves in battle order upon the bottom of the ford in a mass of shields and swords and helmets. He is also connected with the Bull constellation, which, as you probably know, is immediately adjacent to Orion. And in fact, Orion in the Hunter in many depictions is shown uh, holding a shield up uh, uh, you know to protect himself from the charging bull and in his raised arm perhaps holding a weapon like a sword or a spear fiona is often accompanied by his two dogs and we met those in a very early episode didn't we it was uh I'll tell you now what it was it was episode four was it three no <laughs> i'm wrong about that again oh geez i'm wrong about a lot of things today i'm wrong about uh I'm wrong about Facebook working. That's what I'm wrong wrong about. Uh, Finn's Dogs, episode 18. Perhaps represented by the large and small dog constellations straddling the Milky Way. And of course, uh, don't forget that the two dogs faithfully follow Orion across the sky. So Orion crosses the, well, the winter sky. He's not exclusively visible in winter. He's kind of disappeared into the twilight now. But following him on the lower side is Sirius. And of course, on the other side of the river is Procyon or the small dog. His standard, according to some of the later literature, is the likeness of the golden sun half risen from the blue floor of the sea. Is Fionn as Orion alike to his progenitor, the silver-handed catcher, Nuadu? The image of the warrior constellation with the sun in his hand is powerful, representing a special moment in the year when the god-man of the sky clutches the orb of the sun with the sky. Morgan and the Milesians arrived on the shore of the Boyne uh, around 1694 BC, but because the analysts apparently favour uh, the year 6 AD as the actual year of the birth of the cre of the birth of our lord as it were um they believe it was 1700 bc and if you watch what was happening uh the uh sorry the i forgot to say that the laura gawal of the book of invasion says very specifically i think in the second redaction there are three redactions and in one of the redactions it's very specific it's at the moon which basically is the day of the full moon uh, on the calends of May, which is Bialtana, that very, very austere, uh, that very auspicious and important date upon which many important things happen, that and so on. Um, and if you backtrack and you look at the sky in 1700 BC at the time of Bialtana, what's very interesting is that on that day, the day the Milesians were said to have arrived and Aragin placed his foot on the shore of the Boyne River, uh, Orion was holding the sun on that day. He, you know, if you look at the the sun's course through the sky, through the zodiac, as I said, there's a period of a number of days where it's located between the horns of Taurus and the feet of Gemini, uh, and it is above the upraised hand of Orion. It was as if when he was setting foot on the shore, 
The cosmology is fascinating. Uh, Aragine said, who but I knows the place where the sun sets? Well, of course, he knew where it set because he was carrying it across the sky. He was the one that brought it from horizon to horizon as the great catcher of the sky. Um, and that's why we speculated that uh, uh, Aragine uh, uh, and, for instance, Nuadu with the silver arm, Lou with his magic weapons and his ability to defeat Balor uh, and his sturdy arm, which was basically, I think, a way of saying that we're not going to let what happened to Nuadu happen to Lou. He's got a, he's got a long arm, he's got a sturdy arm, uh, and that's not going to happen this time round. The very interesting thing about stories about Fionn McCool, um, folk <laughs> stories more than more so than myths, suggest that it was he that threw a lot of standing stones. That standing stone was said to have been thrown from Schlieve Gullion by Fionn McCool or thrown from the Hill of Tara by Fionn McCool. And what got me wondering, and I haven't studied this, but I think it would be worthy of research, is the possibility that several of those standing stones, like the one at Bal Trey, for instance, have alignments towards solar or, uh, events, calendar events, have alignments towards the moon at certain times. And possibly even, excuse me, have alignments towards particular stars like bright stars of Orion, perhaps just as an idea. But the idea of the sun and moon being aligned on standing stones that were thrown by Fionn McCool is interesting because was it a case that Fionn was throwing something else through the sky, like the sun or the moon, and that that was then aligning with the stone in the ground and that this was sort of a folk way of explaining some uh, knowledge that was very 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 ancient that Fionn was the starry son of the sky who was followed by his two faithful dogs across the sky and that he had thrown these standing stones but in fact what he was throwing was the sun and the moon which were aligning with these stones at various times of the year that was my hypothesis uh, and it is speculative, of course, and there's no definitive way of proving that unless we get another of those Eureka moments that was was dug out of the, the old records from Nova Scotia by James McKillop when he told us that the, the, the people of Nova Scotia explained explicitly that the story of Misha and Deirdre being in separate graves where the trees... Uh, uh, Grew, grew above the graves and entwined together was the story of the creation of the Milky Way that perhaps sometime down the line we might find uh, a similar record of somebody saying yeah well there's an old story told about Fionn McCool throwing them stones but really what that was about was about Orion throwing the sun and the moon around the sky and those being aligned with certain uh, uh, rising events. Now in the case of Baltre there's no specific um, folklore there relating it to Fionn McCool. There is folklore relating it, uh, it to uh, Glass Govlin, the magic cow, which Balor stole uh, from Ulster with its calf and brought it down along the coast and all was going well until they got to the Boyne and when they crossed the Boyne, uh, that's when things went wrong. The calf fell behind, the cow fell behind the calf it had been in front and the calf didn't need to look back because its mother was in front of it. The cow fell behind. The calf turned around to look where its mother was and could see that it was miles from home and let out a big scream. And Balor raised his great eye, which is the sunrise, uh, to see what was going on and turned the two of them into rocks. And they were petrified as the rockabill uh, light. Well, the lighthouses on the rocks these days as the rockabill islands. And those islands mark winter solstice to sunrise from the large standing stone at Baltre. And so there's two standing stones, a large and a small, and one could speculate that one relates to the cow and one to the calf. What's also interesting, though, is that if they were set down in the Neolithic, then Sirius the dog star was also rising at Rockabill. Sorry, it keeps stopping. Uh, Sirius was also shining into the chamber of Newgrange. Uh, although that did not happen indefinitely because of precession of the equinoxes that we described last night, that slow wobble of the Earth's uh, axis, which causes uh, the positions of the stars to change, not relative to each other, but relative to the Earth, that some constellations appear higher in certain epochs and lower in certain other epochs. Now, we will be talking about Orion on summer solstice, but I'm keeping that for June 21st if we get that far. 
who knows, maybe all the lockdowns will be gone at that stage. Maybe we'll have found a miracle cure for COVID-19 and we won't need to do this anymore. Uh, but for the meantime, we'll keep going anyway. Um, so there is nothing explicit here at all, and I understand that. Uh, there's nothing explicit saying Aragin was Orion. There's nothing explicit saying Nuadu was. There's nothing explicit saying Lu was. Uh, this, again, is postulation, speculation, um, a hypothesis based upon uh, the idea that uh, the ancient Irish who built these magnificent monuments and who formulated these wonderful stories uh, must have had had a reasonably complex cosmology uh, in order to, you know, have the, the vision to create these great sites and it, in order to align many of them so accurately with solar and lunar events, it seems unlikely that they would have ignored um, stellar events as well. Now, if you're watching, if you've seen the graphic for tonight's video, and again, apologies, um, uh, that that even that is disrupted because of the way things turned out but anyway i'll try and i'll try and fix it up later you may have seen the graphic earlier on um in that uh, curbstone 52 at newgrange which is the curbstone at the very rear of the monument uh, basically exactly opposite the entrance stone sort of almost as one might say on a sacred axis uh, of the site and that stone is interesting because it appears to contain a large number of cup holes and some of the cup holes are arranged in a series of three together like in a belt contained in what you could call a, a, a some sort of a, a capsule shaped border which we might call a cartouche and i speculated in island of the setting sun that this related to the fact that around and Orion rose above the hill of Red Mountain uh, back in the Neolithic when Newgrange had been built. That uh, before Sirius rose, that you would be able to follow the three bell stars down in a row and you'd be able to see the point at which Sirius would rise. And of course, when Sirius rose, uh, uh, at the moment it rose, because in the Neolithic, because in around 5,000 or so years ago, it shared the same declination as the winter solstice sun. That means its light could potentially be seen in the interior of Newgrange. Now, there'll be all sorts of debate around whether you would see the light of Sirius in, a, in the chamber of Newgrange. I think it's quite possible. <clears throat> I think Sirius is probably bright enough to cast even the dimmest light. But regardless of that is the fact that an, an observer prostrate lying down in the chamber of Newgrange can see through the roof box and could watch for objects like Sirius and, for instance, the morning star Venus, uh, which we discussed uh, in relation to Joseph Campbell in the past couple of episodes, would be able to see those transiting uh, the roof box, tra transiting through the roof box. And over time, they would realise that Sirius was getting higher and higher uh, and would no longer do so. And then, then they would have realised that precession of the equinoxes was a thing. <clears throat> and while the stars are moving, uh, the sun doesn't have that same movement. Precession does not have that effect. In fact, the effect that causes the sun's position to change at the solstice is gradually, sorry. The sun is now two sun widths or one degree inside its range from the Neolithic. Uh, and that is caused by the obliquity of the ecliptic which is an oscillation, a slight, a very slight oscillation uh, in conjunction with a precession that happens to the Earth's axis that causes the axis to be angled between, is it 23 and a half and 25 and a half degrees uh, over a long period of time. Now, the effect of that is that eventually the sun will no longer reach the chamber of New Range for a while, but it will come back again. Uh, what it means at the moment is that the sun does not reach the rear of the back recess of the chamber of Newgrange like it apparently did 5,000 years ago. One of my friends, uh, long-time friends and researchers, Gillies McBain, proposed a theory which I thought was very good in relation to Elkmar and his replacement at Newgrange by Dogda. Uh, uh, we, we, we spoke about Dogda, uh, was it yesterday or the day before, being the sun god who mated with Bowen at... Uh, uh, that th through that union, of course, um, Angus Og was created the miracle child, but that Elkmar had been deposed from uh, Newgrange um, in some tales by Dagda. And that Gillies' suggestion here was that Elkmar represented the star Sirius and that 
the star of Sirius because it, it, precession was changing its position. It was no longer going to shine into Newgrange, whereas Dagda, the sun, was still able to do so. Uh, and that's where the uh, mythology of the changeover might have originated. Of course, these are all speculative notions and ideas, but, I mean, without uh, speculating and without asking questions, I suppose we'll never hope to be able to a answer any of those questions. I usually ask one question and lead to three more. Um, and so uh, it just becomes all the more fascinating. I'm trying to think what else is there in relation to Orion that's important in, in relation to our story. And I'm wondering if I'm leaving out anyone. Let me just quickly check in Ireland that I've covered off. Of course, the the, uh, the hypothesis comes together then uh, in in the High Man chapter where we talk about, you know, Cucullin as the High Man, Lou as the High Man, Fionn McCool as the High Man, and even the possibility of St. Patrick being the High Man, you know. Uh, and that extraordinary coincidence of place names and the arrangement of the figure of the high man uh, pertaining to the landscape where all of these stories were celebrated uh, and the amazing string of coincidences around that. Of course, a string of coincidences does not mean that a hypothesis is valid. And I understand that. I completely do. Uh, I think principle here is the fact that uh, uh, in the Neolithic, the Orion Nebula would have been setting over Tara, viewed from Milmant, which I think, which I still think to this day, is very important. It's like it's like Orion was basically standing at Tara as the king, viewed from Milmant, the burial place of Aragin, who was the one who had to actually act as a sort of a guarantor with Eber, um, when uh, Tia told him that she wanted Drum Cain or what became. Known. So, because of procession of the equinoxes. The sun's position in the zodiac uh, is changing. I, I, I explained this and I just want to sort of just briefly refer to it again. I want to briefly refer to the fact that in the Neolithic, the vernal equinox sun was in Taurus. Uh, in the Bronze Age, it moves into Aries. In uh, the early medieval period, from from basically around the time of the birth of Christ until today, it has been in the constellation of Pisces, leading such uh, experts or such uh, 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 wonderful scholars as C.G. Young to talk about uh, the vernal point being in Pisces, being fascinating with regards to Jesus's claim that I am a fisher of men and the symbolism underlying it. I wondered in in Island of the Setting Sun whether the fact that the vernal point being in Taurus in the Neolithic might account for uh, the proliferation of uh, bovine and particularly bull mythology, especially Thon Bo Kulnia. Uh, now, a lot of scholars believe that Thon Bo Kulnia is an Iron Age myth um, that is dressed up in the milieu of um, medieval times because of the dress and the and the weaponry uh, and the description of chariots etc uh, that have to have emanated from medieval times but yet it has aspects of the story pertaining to the fight of the bulls and their dismemberment as being echoes of uh, very ancient indo-european creation myths who knows how far back some of this stuff goes uh, at some point uh, in the ancient past, Irish astronomers and perhaps others in other parts of the world realized that, you know, uh, like the native, some of the Native American Indian tribes ha broke down the, the constellations along the zodiac into much, much smaller groups than we have today. And they even use bright and darker areas of the Milky Way as part of these groupings. I wonder whether somebody realized in the past that, you know, as when they would have been able to see it with the moon and I've seen it and I've photographed it and I've shared it on Mythical Ireland on several occasions uh, is the fact that midwinter full moon at the moment uh, in this epoch is in the hand of Orion. So you will, it depends on where you are and sometimes you can get lucky. Sometimes it'll be hanging above the horns of Taurus as it's going through the sky and sometimes you'll see it after it's passed above Orion and it's in the feet of Gemini. 
but sometimes you'll get it just right where you can actually visualize it for yourself you can see orion basically carrying the moon across the sky the full moon in winter shining this brilliant light down on us you know and you just think of lou lawfather who who wore the <clears throat> milky way as a ch chain around his neck and you think of him with his tathlum you know and the things that he's going to do with this magic weapon you know i i, I personally think it's fantastic uh, to visualize that uh, and of course those po points are all moving uh, so the vernal point and the solstice point wherever the sun is on solstice it's moving constantly regressing very 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 slowly and gradually uh, westwards through the zodiac i think that's it um but i want to come back to it um and uh look uh, obviously i need to go away and do some work uh, i'm, I'm going to do that now I've, tomorrow is a very busy day in work uh, and generally wednesdays i hardly get a breath i hardly get a moment to do the graphics for that night's episode so I know I'm not going to get time to try and figure out this live streaming stuff tomorrow. So I'm going to have to do it now. It's 25 past nine Irish time. I, I just want to say I'm very, very sorry that I didn't get to say hello to everybody tonight. Um, I was thoroughly and completely distracted. And, and my mind was really in a different place when I began tonight. As you can probably tell, the, the video is probably going to be embarrassing. But anyway... At the same time, it is what it is. That is the nature of uh, live TV, as they say. Uh, these are things that are out of our control. There was no warning given. I didn't get any email or any indication from Facebook saying, we've changed the way we're doing our live broadcast. You may want to have a look at it before you do your next one. Nope. Five to eight, I'm setting it up and I'm realizing, where's the button for the live broadcast gone? And it's gone completely from the phone. And there's no evidence that I can find in the time that i was scrambling around when i should have been starting off the episode i could not find any indication of how it can be done from a phone i find now that they've introduced this thing called live producer on uh the web on the a pc uh, google chrome based smartphones if that's the case that's a bit of a disaster to be honest and another huge retrograde retrograde step for facebook um, and it, it 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 may force me to rethink how I do things. Hopefully, I'll just be able to get myself sorted. Even if it means we do the opposite of normal uh, webcam for Facebook and phone for YouTube. If that works for people, that's okay. I'm just uh, conscious of the fact that people have been watching the Facebook feed tonight and it's blank and they can't see anything. They can just hear me. Not that they need to see me. In fairness, to see to enjoy the episode. But again, just once ap again, apologies for not doing the introductions, which, in fairness, have been a big part of the uh, of the whole experience for people, and I completely understand that. I may come back to Orion tomorrow. I may actually read more. Uh, and I may readdress some of the stuff that I've done tonight. I, 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 I'm especially conscious of the fact for the first 20 minutes or so, I was completely in a, in a, in a different, uh, uh, in a distracted mode, as it were. So I hope you're all keeping well anyway. I, um, I do see that uh, uh, lots of people are saying, don't worry about it, you know. Um, perhaps... Uh, if there's any of you, by the way, I, I'll just make this specially uh, proficient in these things and who, who are aware of uh, a back door or perhaps you found the solution to the problem please please do reach out and let me know because uh, I'm, I'm i'm as soon as i'm finished here uh, I'm, I'm basically going to have to uh, try and find that solution because um it doesn't make sense for me at this stage to abandon one of the platforms especially Facebook, which has been the successful platform. I think there was an episode two or three nights ago uh, on which there were 640 comments, which just goes to show you the fantastic interaction there. Uh, there's 58 viewers here on Facebook. It, it cre crept just above 60, but we've had like 120 uh, at times on Facebook. So it, it is where the bigger audience is. There's 54 or 55,000 followers on the mythical ireland page on facebook where there's where there's about eight and a half thousand here on youtube and anyway, look we'll sort out all that that's all technical uh, details but it, it, it's just like if they had changed it that you needed to, to to try and make adjustments fine but they've actually gotten rid of it it looks to me like it's completely impossible now to live broadcast from your phone uh which which isn't going to suit a lot of people but anyway um perhaps they can't handle the bandwidth and they you know i don't know in the meantime, um, thanks for joining in, joining us. 
Uh, I'll try and upload. Uh, hopefully the YouTube will be fine. Uh, hopefully the YouTube. I don't even know how to end the YouTube. There's no button here to end it. <laughs> this is going to be fun. I might be able to end it to bed later on and you'll be hearing me snoring on the live stream. Um, yeah, as I say, completely, completely distracted. That was just uh, totally out of the blue and, uh, and I'm rambling about it now, I know. Hope you're all well anyway. And I hope that uh, if the... Uh, if you uh, if you were commenting and saying hello and uh, I missed that, I, I do, again, apologise. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure who's watching. I, I can see some names coming up in front of me, but because I'm used to seeing the Facebookers here and the YouTubers on the on the screen, it's, it's again, it's... Right, uh, unless I stop rambling, uh, the YouTube uh, video is going to be very, very... Um, uh, disjointed so I hope to come back to you tomorrow evening at the same time I'll do some tests and I will obviously let you know if uh, if everything is resolved I'll let you know exactly what I plan for tomorrow night I'll give you plenty of advance notice uh, all going well as I said tomorrow is my busiest work day Wednesday is always a very very busy day in work and I tend to find that I don't get time to do to do anything um, in the meantime, somebody says, Margaret Ring is saying Coda is quiet tonight. Yes, he was out for a walk. Um, Amy and Finn brought him for a walk just before I started. Um, so uh, he might be just tired at this stage. And he was fed as well. So I'd say he's putting the head down for a bit of a rest. And that's what I advise us all youth to do. And, and maybe I'll do it myself. But as I said, in the meantime, I have to try and find a, a way of getting things up and running for tomorrow night. That means that people can interact as normal. So, Kolosov, uh, Banakti, um, stay safe. Uh, whether that is mandatory or not, it's probably recommended uh, habit. And hopefully, all going well, we'll see you all again tomorrow evening here for Live Irish Mits, episode 63. In the meantime, as I say, Colour of sound sleep, slang of fall, and apologies for all the uh, technical hitches. And I'm apologising on behalf of Facebook. Why should I do their dirty work for them? Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Now, how do I end? How do I end the uh, YouTube feed? This is going to be very interesting. There's no button that says. There's a button that says live. There's an X. Ooh. Maybe it's the X. So if it's the X, I'm going to very quickly disappear. Thanks, folks.